I'm glad you brought in all of that because of course, lifestyle modification, critically important. But then there are multiple things that can be done. And, and you mentioned some of the newer diabetes drugs, things like SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists that have really made, I think, an enormous impact in reducing cardiovascular risk among people with diabetes and the antithrombotics as well. I'm glad you mentioned, because these are really complementary approaches to correcting dyslipidemia. And speaking of correcting dyslipidemia, now let's say that we've got a patient, we're doing uh, all the right things in terms of recommendations regarding lifestyle modification, weight reduction exercise, uh, that the patient's adherent to all those recommendations, that there's good blood pressure lowering therapy that's implemented, smoking cessation, good diabetes control and so forth. What about dyslipidemia now specifically? And let me turn to Dr. Budoff to discuss a bit about the role of statins in reducing that associated cardiovascular risk from elevated levels of LDL, what the mechanisms of action are, how do you pick between statins, dose, intensity, type, et cetera. And then uh, finally to comment as well, just on potential side effects and concerns around those. Thank you very much. And I think it's so critical. I just want to reemphasize what Dr. Navar touched on. Uh, we have to start with, with lifestyle and, and incorporate that. We're, we're often quick to prescribe a, a, a therapy without, without appropriate background treatment. But, but statins have obviously become our cornerstone of therapy for, for coronary artery disease prevention, uh, as well as secondary treatment. And really, statins have been demonstrated, I think now in almost every possible scenario. Uh, Dr. Navar earlier talked about uh, all of the different scenarios that we could see, everything from primary prevention all the way up to acute coronary syndromes and even polyvascular disease where more than one bed of, of uh, vascular uh, uh, compromise is present. And, and really, statins have been proven across all of those. The statins are, are uh, potent event reducers. Uh, they lower LDL um, based on, on uh, all different uh, doses of statins, but really uh, we get anywhere from about a 18% LDL reduction all the way up to almost a 50% LDL reduction on average, going from the uh, mildest of statins all the way up to the highest doses of the most potent statins. So we can really uh, effectively reduce uh, LDL. And we, what we've seen in clinical trials is that LDL reduction parallels event reduction. So as we get larger numbers of LDL uh, drop in our patients, we see larger reductions in cardiovascular risk. And I don't want to go into all the, the trials, but I think one study in, in particular is important when we think about how we can further lower risk. And that's when we look at trials like Treat to New Target, a study that looked at a torvastatin versus a torvastatin. So really uh, taking away a, a lot of the differences that we might think about, but 10 milligrams of a torvastatin, and then increasing that in stable coronary patients to 80 milligrams of a torvastatin. And we had an additional 22% uh, risk reduction by lowering LDL, um, additionally by going to a higher dose. So I think we've seen a uh, proportional event reduction based on LDL lowering, We've seen a consistent benefit, and certainly those at higher risk have greatest benefit. So the patients who derive the greatest benefit are those patients who have um, the highest risk. So acute coronary syndromes and patients with vascular disease in multiple beds are going to derive even more event reduction from uh, statin therapy. When we talk about how it works, I think it's important to remember that HMG-CoA reductase uh, is the rate-controlling enzyme uh, for the um, mevalinate pathway. And I'm not going to go into any biochemistry here, but that really is the, uh, the rate controlling step for, for cholesterol synth synthesis. So we can stop, uh, really in the liver, we stop LDL uh, synthesis. And I think it's important when I talk to my patients, when I explain that they've tried weight reduction and they've hopefully been compliant with exercise and other therapies and now their LDL is still high and they're, they're often perplexed because they've changed their diet and they're not, you know, in their mind, doing the things that got them into trouble and their LDL is still too high. And I remind them that their liver produces uh, most of the cholesterol and if they're, if they're genetically 
predisposed to produce too much cholesterol, then they're going to need some help in blocking that, that mechanism. So we implement statin therapy. And then when we think about what dose or, or how to implement therapy, I simply look at their current LDL and their, at least what I would perceive to be their target LDL. And while I'm a firm believer in lower is better, and I know we're going to get into targets a little bit later, I think that we have to think about uh, going straight to more aggressive uh, uh, statins sometimes when we have a high-risk patient with a high LDL. Uh, I'm not a big fan of starting at 10 milligrams of statin X, and then when they fail that, titrating up to 20, and then titrating up to 40, and then titrating up to 80. It not only takes a long time, but the patient fails at each step along the way. Um, they, they consider that a, a therapeutic failure if I have to, each time I see them, up titrate. So a lot of times, uh, if, they have, if they need a larger LDL reduction, I will go to a larger dose. And, and where we commonly start with a torvastatin 80 milligrams, um, the highest dose of one of the most potent statins, um, uh, right out of the gate when patients come in with acute coronary syndromes or patients come in with severe coronary disease and need to be more aggressively managed. Um, so I think, I think that's really important to balance all of the treatments. We have to remember the side effects. And, and you know, the adage is you can't make an asymptomatic person feel better, um, at least not with our traditional cardiac medications. Um, but I think it's important to remember that we can make them feel worse. And we do get myalgias resulting from statin therapy. And while it's probably... Um, you know, maybe 10% of our patients, maybe more, depending on what, what study you cite and what your personal experience is, uh, maybe even where you live. I think we end up with more statin-induced myalgias here in Southern California, where people want reasons not to do it and to, to do things in a, a, a less, uh, a more holistic way. But uh, the bottom line is, is that when patients get myalgias, they often are dose-related. So the first thing I would do is if I had them on a higher dose of a statin is to try to decrease the dose a little bit. Obviously you lose potency, but you also hopefully decrease the incidence of myalgias. And then if that doesn't work, uh, other, other therapeutic options are to change statins. There are kind of classes of statins. Some are more water soluble and some are more lipid soluble. So we could try a water-soluble statin, perhaps, a, a pravastatin or a rosuvastatin, a patavastatin are better tolerated by some. Um, and if that doesn't work, then going even to every other day rosuvastatin, I realize that's an off-label use, but it seems to help some patients by spacing out the therapy. And again, each time you go down in potency or go down to a less potent statin, you do lose some LDL effect and, th and that might impact their overall risk. I think that's really a lot of useful pearls that you threw in there. I, I found the same thing with the every other day resuvastatin. It is often pretty well tolerated even in people that have had myalgias with multiple other regimens. And there's pitavastatin as well. Some people have found if all other statins are causing problems, sometimes it's trying something different can do the trick. 